was we had Wednesday night prayer meetings in the Baptist church, and we don't do that much anymore, but there's a story told about a deacon that would come every Wednesday night to Wednesday night prayer meeting, and he would be the one that would always conclude the prayer meeting in prayer. And at the end of his prayer, he said the same thing every week. And here's what he said. And Lord, clean all the cobwebs out of my life. Now, the cobwebs obviously were, you know, things in your life that aren't supposed to be there. And so you're asking the Lord, you know, clean out all the sins of my life that had gathered during the week. Well, one Wednesday night, it got too much for one of the other men who was attending the prayer meeting. And sure enough, the deacon decided to end the prayer meeting the same way. And Lord, clean all the cobwebs out of my life. To which this other man stood up and he said, Lord, Lord, don't do it. Kill the spider. That's what needs to happen. <laughs> This comical story gives weight to what Paul is saying as he continues on with qualifications for officers in the church, especially deacons. They too, as we're going to see um, from last time we were together, they too, just like the elders, are to have blameless lives. And so tonight we're going to move from the qualifications of elders to the qualifications of deacons. Now, some unfortunately have thought that the office of a deacon is a lesser office. But ladies, nothing could be further from the truth, as we're going to see in this lesson. Both elders and deacons' qualifications are almost identical. If you did your homework, they're almost identical with the exception of just a few. And so let's look at them together as we look at verses 8 through 13. Paul says this of chapter 3, Likewise, deacons must be reverent, not double-tongued, not given to much wine, not greedy for money, holding the mystery of the faith with a pure conscience. But let these also first be tested, and then let them serve as deacons, being found blameless. Likewise, their wives must be reverent, not slanderous, temperate, faithful in all things. Let deacons be the husbands of one wife, ruling their children in their own houses well. For those who have served well as deacons obtain for themselves a good standing and great boldness in the faith which is in Christ Jesus. Now when we were together last time, two weeks ago, we saw 16 qualifications, uh, non-negotiable qualifications for an elder. In the lesson tonight, we're going to consider seven qualifications for deacons, and I have put them in an acrostic for you so that you can remember them, and the acrostic is deacons. How clever is that? <laughs> and so they're not going to be quite in that order, but you will have a word for each one of the letters in the word deacon. Now, as I mentioned, uh, deacons do have to be biblically qualified, okay? A lot of churches, they're not. A lot of churches, what happens, at least what I've seen, is, okay, you have a man out there, he's, you know, he's good looking, he wears a nice suit to church, and so let's put him up in the office of a deacon. But ladies, this is a wrong choice. This is a false assumption. Deacons must be qualified just like elders. And so let's begin with the first four qualifications in verse 8. Paul says, likewise, deacons must be reverent. And so he starts out by using a word likewise, which means in the same way. In other words, just like the elders are to be qualified, just like the elders are to be men of integrity, so are deacons. They are to be men of integrity. Now, again, I want to say the office of a deacon is of no lesser importance than the office of an elder. They have different functions. But both deacons and elders are servants. That's all they are. They're table waiters. They're servants um, of the Most High God, just like you and I are. We're just servants. Nobody is the big spiritual giant. Now, since we're going to be talking about deacons, we need to define what is a deacon. Remember when we were together last time, we talked about elders. How did elders get started? Well, they started when Paul went around and started churches in various cities. And remember, as they would start these churches, then they would ordain elders in every city. And so deacons also had a start, and they started in Acts chapter 6. And so if you want to turn back to Acts chapter 6, here we'll see the beginning of this office of deacon and how it got started. Acts chapter 6 is the first accounting of a deacon. And by the word way, the Greek word deacon is dionikos, which just means a table waiter. That's all they are, table waiters, an attendant, a servant. 
which is what we all are, right? We're servants of God. So here's the first accounting of deacons, Acts chapter 6. It says, Now in those days when the number of the disciples was multiplying, there arose a murmuring against the Hebrews by the Hellenists because their widows were neglected in the daily menstruation. Then the twelve called the multitude of the disciples together, and they said, It's not desirable that we should leave the word of God and serve tables. Therefore, seek from among you seven men, and look at these qualifications, of good reputation, full of the Holy Spirit and wisdom, that we might appoint over this business. But we are going to give ourselves continually to prayer in the ministry of the word. And, of course, the saying pleased the whole multitude, and here's who they chose. Stephen, a man full of faith and Holy Spirit. Philip, Prochorus, Nicanor, Timon, Parmenius, Nicholas, who was a proselyte of Antioch. They sat before the apostles, and when they prayed, they laid hands on him, them. And so here is the founding of deacons. Um, evidently, the widows were being neglected. Uh, remember, in biblical times... Uh, usually what happened was you went out and you worked all day and that and you got your wages and you went out and got your food and so if a woman's husband died she was completely without in fact that's what the Greek word widow means it means she's just without she's without husband and of course we're going to see when we get to chapter 5 her children are supposed to take care of her but if her children don't take care of her then the church is supposed to take care of her and so these widows were being neglected. They had no husband. They had no means of food. And, you know, they weren't like in our day, you know, go get a job at Home Depot or go get a job at Starbucks. That wasn't possible in biblical times. And so they were being neglected. They needed money to sustain their life. And so there was some complaining going on about this. And so the 12 disciples, remember Judas has already hung himself and they've chosen Matthias. So the 12 disciples get together and they call all the followers of Jesus and they said, Hey, we need to be giving ourselves to the ministry of the word and prayer. This is what we're called to do, which by the way is what elders are called to do. They're supposed to give themselves over to prayer and to the word of God. So we need to be doing this. We don't have time to do this. And so we need to appoint some men that will go and serve tables and minister to the widows. And so that's where the word deacon comes from. Now, these men cannot be just riffraff off the street. If you notice the qualifications here in Acts, they have to be men that have wisdom, they have to be filled with the Holy Spirit, and they must have a good reputation. And so deacons in biblical times, they not only looked after the poor, this would be widows and orphans, but they took care of their physical needs, they kept the place of worship in order, they would... Uh, collect that we would call the offering, uh, they would take the collections, uh, the contributions. And it's pretty similar to what we see, at least in most churches today. I know a lot of churches, they have different uh, governing, um, you know, government, but the way if you have elders and deacons in a church, usually that's what happens when you have deacons. They look, at, look after the physical needs in the church. Uh, the people that have needs are usually involved in serving. They usually take communion. They usually participate in the Lord's Supper. So that's what a deacon is. Now, Paul says the first thing that deacons must be is reverent. This is the D on your acrostic. They must be dignified. Dignified. That's what reverent means. They must be dignified. What does that mean? They must be respectable. They must be serious. Now, as we saw last time, that was also a qualification for an elder. It does not mean a deacon can't have a sense of humor, okay? But he must be serious when it comes to things of the Lord. And so we're not going to elaborate on some of these because um, if you weren't here when we talked about qualification of elders, I elaborated uh, quite a bit on each one, but I don't want to repeat some of the things I said last time. So he must be dignified. Secondly, they must not be double-tongued. This would be the C on your acrostic. They must have a controlled tongue. A controlled tongue. Now, what does it mean to be double-tongued? Well, it means this. It means I say one thing to one person, let's say Rita, but then I turn around and I say another thing to Lee. And so I've said something to read it, but I said the opposite to Lee. So I'm double-tongued. I'm hypocritical. It's nothing more than lying and deception. And this could be very possible when you look at what deacons do because the temptation would be 
to use flattery to be deceptive as they minister to the needs of others and took care of the church of God. The same would be true in our day. Deacons have a temptation to be man-pleasers. For example, as they deal with the needs of the body, the congregation, you know, maybe there is someone in our church that's a widow and she can't pay her mortgage this month, and the deacon goes to her house and he says, well, I'm so sorry, you know, don't worry, the, you know, do we have a... We have a widow's fund, and we'll help you out, and, and we'll take care of your mortgage this month. But then he comes back to the pastor, or maybe the elders, or someone else, and he said, you know, I went over to so-and-so's house, and quite frankly, if she'd just get off the couch and go get a job, and, you know, quit going out to eat every meal, she'd be able to pay her mortgage. So see, he, he would use his mouth for double tongue, saying one thing to the widow, or the person that had a need, and saying another thing to the pastor, or to some of the people in the congregation. Um, I remember we had not a deacon but an elder in one of our former churches and um, I remember telling my husband, I said, honey, he, he just is double-tongued. I mean, you know, four days ago he told me this and yet when we got to the place where we were supposed to do this, he said something else. And uh, I just, I seemed to be confused all the time because I didn't know what she meant. Do you mean this or do you mean that? And it's kind of like a politician. And uh, I would often tell Doug, this man seems double tongued. And uh, unfortunately, he finally was exposed along with other sins besides just being double tongued. Now, thirdly, they're not to be given to much wine. They're not to be drunkards. This is the N on your acrostic, not a drunk. <laughs> they are not to be a drunk. Now, Paul mentions this same quality for elders. But here he adds a word. Did you notice? He says the deacon is not to be given to, and he adds the word, much wine. Much wine. Now, I was trying to think through this. Why does he add that? Why does he add the word much? And I thought, well, that makes sense. Because as a deacon, what? They're ministering to the needs of people. And so more than likely they would go from house to house to see, you know, what the needs would be. They could maybe visit five to ten houses in a day. And you know what? In those times, you wouldn't, if someone came into your house, a deacon came into your house to minister to you or attend to your needs, you're not going to offer them a glass of water. Because in biblical times, water, as we talked about, uh, was not safe to drink, but wine was. It was much more diluted than ours. And so, you know, Deacon Joe has a, a glass of wine at... Uh, widow so-and-so's house, and an hour later he arrives at so-and-so's house, and he has another drink of wine, and so, you know, by the time you visit five or ten widows or five or ten people in your congregation that need help, well, you might be, you know, a little drunk by then. So that's the only reason I could think of. If you have a better reason, then uh, let me know about that. But he, anyway, deacons are not to be given too much wine. Now, remember, the wine in New Testament times was much weaker. But if you drank enough of it, you could get drunk. Okay. One man helps us here with this. He says, It is extremely difficult for the 20th century American to understand and appreciate the society of Paul's day. The fact that deacons are told to become total abstainers, but rather, or not told to be total abstainers, but rather to be temperate, does not mean that Christians today can use liquor in moderate amounts. The wine employed for the common beverage was very largely water. The social stigma and the tremendous social evils that accompany drinking today did not attach themselves to the use of wine as a common beverage in the homes of Paul's day. Nevertheless, as the church grew and Christians consciousness and conscience developed, the dangers of drinking came to be more clearly seen. The principle laid down elsewhere by Paul that Christians should not do anything to cause a brother to stumble came to be applied to the use of wine. And so maybe that will help us um, understand a little bit why Paul uses this both also as a qualification for an elder and for a deacon. They are not to be given to wine. Now, notice the next qualification, and don't laugh at me, okay? The next qualification is the E, you can laugh at me if you want, is the E on your acrostic. It is eager for money, a no-no. <laughs> Eager, well, you know, what can you do? Eager for money, a no-no. Notice what Paul says. 
He is not to be greedy for money. He's not to be greedy for money. Same thing as the elders. Not greedy for money means he's not to get money by greedy or disgraceful ways. This, again, was a qualification for an elder that we had a few weeks ago. However, for a deacon, it's perhaps more needed because, remember, deacons would be entrusted with the monies. They would distribute the monies to the widows or the orphans or to those who had a need, as we just saw in Acts chapter 6. And we also have the account, you can turn there if you want to, uh, where this is clean, seen pretty clearly in John chapter 12. And so if you want to turn over to John chapter 12, uh, this is the account of Judas. But in John 12, verses 1 through 6, if you want to just listen, that's fine too. It says, Six days before the Passover, Jesus came to Bethany, where Lazarus was, who had been dead, whom he had raised from the dead. And there they made him a supper, and Martha served, but Lazarus was one of those who sat at the table with him. Then Mary... She took a pound of very costly oil of spikenard. She anointed the feet of Jesus and wiped his feet with her hair. And the house was filled with the fragrance of the oil. But one of his disciples, Judas Iscariot, Simon's son who would betray him, said, Why wasn't this fragrant oil not sold for 300 denarii and given to the poor? And this he said, not that he cared for the poor, but because he was a thief, and he had the money box, and he used to take what was put in it. Judas was an unbeliever, as we know, but the temptation was for him to pocket, and evidently he did. The same it would be with the deacons. The deacons had access to the monies, and so it would be very, very important that this would not be a temptation. If someone has this temptation to be greedy for money. This is disqualifying for the office of a deacon. Well, we move on to a must-needed quality for a deacon in verse 9. Notice what Paul says. Holding the mystery of the faith with a pure conscience. So, the next quality on your acrostic is the S. They must stand firm in the faith. They must stand firm in the faith in the faith. Paul says they must hold the mystery of the faith. Now, we know from other studies in Ephesians and other Bible studies we've done together that the word mystery just means something that was once hidden but now is revealed. And we know the word mystery pertains to the gospel. And so this means that deacons must hold fast to the mystery of the faith. They must believe in the death, the burial, the resurrection, and the ascension of our Lord. And they must hold fast to these tenets of the faith. As Paul says in another place, Colossians 1, 26, 27, the mystery, here's the mystery, which has been hidden from ages, but now is made manifest, to whom God will to make known the riches of this mystery, the mystery again, which which is among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Ladies, that is the mystery. Uh, in fact, later on, we're going to see next week in verse 16, Paul says, And without controversy, great is the mystery, here he uses that word again, mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh, justified in the spirit, seen by angels, preached among the nations, believed on in the world, and received up into glory. And so Paul says, if you are going to be a deacon, if you're going to hold the office of a deacon, then you, you need to hold fast to the mystery. You need to stand firm in the faith. In fact, the Greek word hold has the idea of something that is possessed. Now, they're not possessed, but something that is possessed. They hold fast to the doctrine of the mystery of the gospel. So, deacons and all believers should hold firmly to their faith. To do otherwise is nothing but false faith. And ladies, we've already seen two men, Hymenaeus and Alexander, who were probably leaders in the church. And we saw this very early in our study. They made shipwreck of their faith. They did not hold fast to the mystery of the gospel. And notice what Paul adds here. 
He says they must do this with a good conscience or a pure conscience. We know Hymenaeus and Alexander did not have a good conscience. They had a seared conscience. But deacons must hold fast to the faith with a pure conscience. Ladies, deacons, just like you and I, you can have all the right doctrine. You can be in a church that has the doctrine down to a T, just like you like it. But if you don't have the right conduct, and if deacons don't have the right conduct, if they don't have a pure conscience, then they don't have the right religion, and they don't have Christianity. If your heart's corrupt, your life is corrupt, right? So it's one thing to hold fast to the mystery, but it's another thing to do that with a pure conscience, with a life that lives out what you believe. Well, Paul continues on with the sixth qualification for a deacon in verse 10. Notice what he says. But let those also be first tested. Then let them serve as deacons being found blameless. Now, in order to make sure that their faith and conduct are intact, they first need to be tested before they serve as a deacon. Uh, the word test here just means to test like you would coins to see if they're genuine, to see if they're real. It's kind of like we saw last time when we were looking at the qualification of an elder. Uh, he's not to be a novice. He's not to be a new Christian. Um, he's to be older in the faith before you put him into that office of a elder. The same would be for a deacon. You would not want to put a new convert as a deacon, but you want to wait. You want to see if his life demonstrates that, and so he needs to be tested. I know a lot of churches that put men into the office of deacon and elder, and uh, then they see if they're qualified. But ladies, that's doing it backwards. They first have to be tested. They need to be qualified. Um, they're approved or they're tested first, and then they're put into the office. Um, in fact, in our church, the way it's done here, uh, the elders observe the lives of the men in the church for at least a year. If we have new people come into our church and the elders feel like this man is, seems like a godly man, and they watch his life for a year at least before they decide to interview him and see if he has a desire, first of all, to be an, an officer, but also if they are biblically qualified. Now let me say this. Since Paul says that deacons must be tested, I would say this, that even though your church, I don't know how your, you know, every church is governed, in this church we have deacons and elders, but just because you have deacons and elders and they're qualified, it doesn't mean that you let down. They need to be continually tested. Because many times a, an officer of the church will be qualified, but then something happens and he has to, you know, he's disqualified. And so we need to be constantly testing them and making sure that they remain qualified. Um, unfortunately, sometimes we don't find out until it becomes a public scandal and then they're forced to resign. But it would be better if, you know, they just resigned on their own when they realize they are no longer uh, qualified. I think wise churches will have men who are held accountable and frequently tested to make sure that they are qualified according to the scriptures. And when the test is over, Paul says they should be found blameless. This is the sixth on your acrostic, and it's the letter A. They must be above reproach. They must be above reproach, just like the elders. They must be blameless. There should be no accusation against them. There should be no reproach on their name. No one should be able to come up to them and, and say anything about their life that would bring a reproach on them or the name of Christ. Now, I know some of you would like me to skip verse 11, but we're not going to. In between the qualifications, I don't know why Paul does this. It's very odd. You know, he's given the qualifications for elders and deacons, and all of a sudden he breaks away from the qualification of the deacons, and then he goes back to it when he gets done here. But in the middle, he puts this mysterious verse that has caused more controversy and has more than one possible interpretation. Paul now brings women into the picture, and he says this, Likewise, their wives must be reverent, not slanderers, temperate, faithful in all things. I had a lady email me the other day, and she goes, what do you do if one of the elders or deacons' wives are a mess? And I go, well, I don't know. I, I don't know. I'm a mess myself, but I don't know what you do. 
But uh, let's talk about this verse. Now, let me tell you this. The word there is not in the Greek, okay? So it reads, likewise wives. That's how it reads. Likewise, likewise wives. So, the question comes to mind, who are the wives? Well, some people think it's the wives of the deacons because he has just been talking about the deacons. Other people hold to the fact that it's the wives of the elders and the deacons, and then still some hold to the fact that it is women deacons. But that brings me to some other questions. If it is the deacons' wives, then why doesn't Paul have qualifications for the elders' wives? That would get me off the hook since I'm an elder's wife. I guess I don't have to be qualified, so that'd be great. Also, since the word there is not in the original, then it appears to point to women deacons. Now, do not be disturbed, okay? I am not going to die on this hill. It's not, you know, it's not one of those things I'm going to die on the hill for. Do not be disturbed if this is your position of women deacons. This is not a position of authority. There is no authority in this position. This is really probably, and you can go back and look at your Greek studies and things like that, um, John MacArthur's church, they have women deacons. This is, this is not a position of authority, but this is probably the intended meaning because the word for wives just means women. That's all it means. Likewise, women. These would be women servants, women table waiters. Also, it appears with the word likewise, remember he's already, he's already said likewise deacons, that's a different classification of people. Now he says likewise women, indicating what? A different classification of people. Now, there are deaconesses mentioned in the word of God, okay? Paul mentions one in Romans 16.1. He says, I commend you to you Phoebe, our sister, who is a servant in the Lord at the church at Sincre. And then he says, Receive her in the Lord in a manner worthy of the saints, and assist her in whatever business she has need of you, for she has been my helper. She's been a helper of many, but she's been my helper also, Paul says. And so there were biblical women deacons in the Bible, and they were there to help the male deacons. Uh, with the responsibilities that they had. And, you know, I was thinking about this biblically and just uh, morally. Um, it would be wise because there are many uh, jobs that deacons have to do that really would not be appropriate uh, to go into a widow's home uh, by himself. It would be more appropriate for the woman to go and minister to women, women to women and men to men. So. Um, regardless of which view you wish to take, you know, if you believe it's elders' wives, if you believe it's elders and deacons' wives, if you believe it's women deacons, uh, it doesn't matter. Like I said, I'm not going to die on that hill. But regardless of which view you wish to take, Paul says these women must also have certain qualities about them. And I don't know if you noticed this, but it's interesting. The four qualities that he mentions that these women must have are also the four qualities that are mentioned in Titus 2 that the older women must have that are discipling young women. The older women are what? They must have behavior that becomes holiness. They're not to be false accusers. They're not to be given to wine. And they're to be teachers of good things. So they very fit well fit in to these four qualifications. Now, Paul writes here in 1 Timothy, these women must be reverent. Um, that would be what Titus says, behavior that is holy. She must be temperate. That would be sober, faithful in all things, which would be similar to being a teacher of good things. So, first of all, whoever these women are, they must be reverent in their behavior. In the Greek, this means she must have behavior that becomes a priest or a priestess. She must be holy. Um, she must be set apart. She must have a godly separated life. She must be dignified. And Paul has already said that deacons must be dignified. They must be reverent. And so whoever these women are, they are the same. They must be reverent. Secondly, she must not be a slanderer. Um, she should not be involved in gossip, slander, criticism. Um, you've heard me say this before, John Calvin says talkativeness is a disease of women, it gets worse with age, but he also says there's nothing more slippery or loose than the tongue. 
And so women especially, I think, need to be careful about this. Um, women must not be loose with their tongue. In fact, I heard, of, the first time I've ever heard this, ever, um, happened just a few months ago, I heard of a pastor <clears throat> who had to step down as pastor because of his wife. And his wife was involved in gossip and slander, and she was tearing the church apart with her tongue. And so the other elders in the church asked him to step down. Women should not be involved, especially any type of woman in leadership position. Thirdly, they must be temperate. This means she must be sober-minded. Um, she must have her senses about her. Elizabeth Elliot says it means to wise her up to her wifely duties. Um, she should be self-controlled with her passions, whether they're physical, sexual, emotional, um, her thought life, her speech, all of it. She should be self-controlled. And under this umbrella would also be the same admonition for elders and deacons when you're thinking about being self-controlled. It would be in the area of being temperate with drink. Um, in fact, in Titus it says she's not to be enslaved to wine. And so it's the same Greek word to be self-controlled, have all of her um, faculties under control. And then lastly, Paul mentions about these women. They're to be faithful in all things. Um, Titus says she's to be faithful to teach good things to young women. But here Paul says she's to be faithful in all things. This means foremost of everything, she should be faithful to the Lord. She should be faithful to the Lord, faithful to her commitments, faithful to her family, faithful to her church, faithful to use her spiritual gifts. Anything that God calls her to do, she should be faithful. Now, Paul shifts now back. I'm sure you're glad that's over. Fall be the dumb green. I don't know. Back to the qualities of the deacon, and he finishes up with the seventh and last quality of a deacon. Notice what he says. Let deacons be the husband of one wife, ruling their children and their own houses well. So the seventh and final quality of a deacon is the O on your acrostic. He must have an ordered family life. He must have an ordered family or orderly family life. Paul puts it like this. He must be the husband of one wife. And he must rule his children well. Now, we saw this when we looked at qualification of elders. He must be a one-woman man. We went into all the ramifications of that. Can he be a widower? Can he have an unbelieving wife? And as I said, you need to go back and re-listen to that lesson if you weren't here on qualifications of elders. He also must rule his children well. Remember, we saw when we were looking at elders. If a man doesn't know how to take care of his own house, how can he take care of the church of God? He can't. And so he must have his uh, one. He must have one wife, and he must rule his children well. Um, and then Paul finishes his remarks regarding deacons in verse thirteen. And notice what he says: For those who have served well as deacons obtain for themselves a good standing and great boldness in the faith which is in Christ Jesus. So those men who serve as deacons. They obtain for themselves two things. Notice what it is. First of all, a good standing. Secondly, great boldness in the faith. Interesting word here, good standing, indicates the spiritual growth of a deacon. They're respected. Um, they have a good report. In fact, it actually means uh, step up. It's like the deacons are put on a pedestal. That's really what the Greek word means. They're, 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 they're stepping up. They're put on a pedestal, and not to be put on a pedestal, a pedestal so that they will be prideful, but to be put on a pedestal in order to be respected. And so um, they that serve as deacons, they have a good standing, but also, notice what Paul says, they have great boldness, which means as he serves as a deacon, he receives a good and respectable reputation for his service, and he becomes confident and bold, in his service towards God and others. And notice, ladies, this boldness and confidence is not in himself, but in the faith, Paul says, which is in Christ Jesus. All officers of the church, whether they're deacons, whether they're elders, whether you believe in women deacons or not, know that we men, deacons, elders, they are nothing in themselves. Nothing. Nothing. Absolutely nothing. But because of the servant's heart and the gifts that God has given elders and deacons, 
They can be confident. God has called them to this office. And so they obtain two things, a good standing and great boldness in the faith. So what are the seven qualifications for deacons? Dignified, eager for money is a no-no, above reproach, controlled tongue, ordered family, orderly family life, not a drunk, and stands firm in the faith. Now, once again, as I said last time, this lesson may not send spiritual goosebumps up your spine. Um, but I want to encourage you, and I was so thankful, one of the ladies from last time said, could I please have all those prayer requests that you gave us um, to pray for the elders? She was the only one that did, but I say, that's great. If just one woman in this church will pray for the elders, and that would be great. Um, and so this lesson, may, you may say, well, this doesn't matter to me. But ladies, it does matter. I hope you're concerned about the leaders in your church. I can't tell you how many women just at the group table tonight say, you know, I've never been in a church where, you know, you actually have to be qualified to be an elder or a deacon. And um, we need to be concerned. We need to make sure that the men in our church are qualified to God's, according to God's standards, and not what we think or what man thinks. We must pray for them, and I hope you do pray. I love it when Sharon, every Sunday, puts on our giddy, our church's website, pray for your pastor. And I want to say yes, if you only knew the kind of attacks. Even today, I thought, oh my, I don't know if he's going to, um, something happened, and I, I, I just think if people really knew on a daily basis the kind of attacks that my husband has on him all the time, even from his parishioners, we must pray for them. We must encourage them. And we must live our lives in the same way. As women, we need to be setting godly examples. We need to be faithful in our home life, faithful in our speech, and faithful and blameless in our walk with Christ. Well, in closing, the following was also a true story. It's not about the cobweb or the spider. But <clears throat> there was a man named Dr. John Watson, and when he was a little boy, he loved to sit in church and watch the procession of the deacons come forward to serve the Lord's Supper. And he especially was eyeing one particular deacon. He was an older man that had gray hair and a re very reverent face, and he just was really enamored with this deacon. And one day, as this little boy was walking on the road, he was heading home, he noticed a man over to the right. He was taking these stones and breaking them. And he thought, that guy has white hair. Oh, that's the deacon in our church. That's the one I admire every Sunday that, you know, takes the communion and serves everybody. And so he went home and he told his dad about it. He said, Daddy, he said, this is really odd. I was coming home and that man that serves the elements every Sunday, he was out there breaking stones in the field. And his father turned to the son and he said, the reason why this old man had... Uh, excuse me, why the old man held such a high place in the church was that although he was one of the poorest men in all the town, he was one of the holiest. And then he looked to his son and he said, Son, this man breaks the stones for a living, but he knows more about God than any person I have ever met. And you know, that is my prayer for the deacons and the elders in this church and for churches everywhere that are committed to the truth of God's word, that they would be men of integrity, men of holiness, and men that know God more than anybody else. So let's pray as we close. Father, I do thank you for the leaders of this church. I thank you for the leaders of the churches that are represented. And Father, I do pray that we would take these verses very seriously because, Father, we know that we will be like our teacher. And so if we have elders and deacons that aren't qualified and are leading us down wrong paths, then we will follow them. And so, God, I would pray that we would um, pray for our leaders, that we would pray for the men of our church, that we would hold them accountable, that we would be willing to ask hard questions of them, and, Lord, that we would um, support them and encourage them. Lord, we do pray for the Church of Jesus Christ worldwide because, Lord, Father, we know that it is suffering, that it is in a mess. And I do pray, God, that you would raise up men that would desire the office of bishop and deacon, Lord, men that are qualified, men that would be able to lead their congregations in the paths of righteousness for your name's sake. I pray this, Father, that you would be glorified.